welcome to Mountain Goat Talk. My name is John, and today I have Dan Hobbs with me to talk about his recent record breaking for the FKT or fastest known time uh, for consecutively climbing Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks in one push. And before we give them the answer on how fast exactly you did that. Uh, let's talk some things through. So first off, where are you from and where you did your training? Yeah, I'm from Minnesota. So it's a flat state, nowhere near any mountains. <laughs> and, uh, I, have been, I, sp I live in the Minneapolis, St. Paul metro area, which is really flat. There's a reason they put it there. I have two kids that I'm primarily responsible for. So I did the vast majority of my training in Minnesota. Um, the hill that I trained on that's near my home is uh, 100 and, 140 feet. If you really stretch it, it's like 143 feet. <laughs> and, uh, I train every day on that hill. I mean, I did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laps. And I, I built up to about 70 laps a day, 10,000 feet of elevation a day on a 140-foot hill. First half of the record, there's these big rocks you're like hopping off of and and the impact on your knees is huge because your knees are getting way bent up and you're you know dropping down and i didn't have any training on that going into it because even though i was doing ten thousand feet of elevation a day it was all just this smooth slope and so even where the it wasn't grassy it was just like dirt and small rocks and so i didn't get that big impact and and it was a little yeah. softer ground. Yeah, I, I think I had yeah. a friend of mine say they can't run on concrete because it hurts their their feet too much. And I didn't realize yeah. there was such a big difference between yeah. dirt and concrete, but there is a big difference. So if you're running on rocks, it hurts a lot more and it gets through your shoes and into your knees. And what, what kind of uh, footwear did you end up with? Did you end up with like a running shoe or a trail shoe or... Yeah, a combo. I had five pairs of shoes. I had kind of a mid middle shoe for like class three that was comfortable, but all of them were in the trail runner slash trail shoe um, genre, you could say. So they were all, you know, low top shoes. I didn't wear any hiking boots ever. And lightweight was the key and absolutely no Gore-Tex. Okay, so let's talk about inspiration on why. So you've hiked these peaks before back yeah. when 2013 you said yeah yep 2013 okay. was the first time i finished them and you did it in 24 days then did yeah okay just to give a teaser as to how fast you did it now so then uh what changed between then and now and why did you want to do it again <laughs> yes man what a journey so mountains are part of my whole life story and um, in 2013, I had just been divorced. I was dealing with extreme depression, like in bed, 20 some hours a day, unable to work. And I was dealing with a battle with suicide. And I'm a spiritual person. And I woke up one day and said, I'm going to climb all the 14ers. And that's how I'm going to beat depression. And it just like came out of my mouth. And I was like, I literally put my hands over my mouth. because I was like, what? Where did that come from? It was like a divine, <laughs> divine revelation. And I I didn't even know how many there were. So like it came out of my mouth and I was like, all right, well, I guess that's how I'm going to beat depression. So that's what I'm going to do. And later I found out there's like 58 and they're really hard and, <laughs> and all of this. So and that was like May when I, when I, when I said that. And so I was like, well, um, better get to it. So I started training and I had my kids a lot then they were really young back then. And so I, most of my training was putting them in a bike trailer in Minneapolis and biking around town with two kids behind me. And, um, uh, in August of that year, I showed up in Colorado with a, with a four door 1998 Saturn SL2 with like 230,000 miles on it. <laughs> and found a truck and printed out all the routes from 14ers.com had no idea what I was doing at all whatsoever, but I was there to beat depression. And I thought when I left, I thought, well, if I can do this in 30 days, that would be a miracle, you know, um, yeah. absolute miracle. And I finished 24 days later and I just didn't stop. I really didn't know what I was doing. I got lost for an entire day. I like literally drove in circles for an entire day, uh, <laughs> because I was using a paper map and, the map said there was a road over the Sangres and 
there just doesn't happen to be a road over the sound gray he's a park ranger in the sand dunes great sand dunes national park laughed and i finally found somebody like where's this road he was like <laughs> oh they closed that in like the 1940s <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, and they still say there's a pass on the north side of the Santa Cristos, and I don't believe yeah. it. I've never yeah. seen it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's there. I mean, I think again, like this guy said, there's probably something there, like from 70 years ago, kind of. Yeah. Thing. If anybody knows where that is, tell me, because yeah. I haven't yeah, seen right? it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. It's a it's yeah. a mystery. So you bought a truck. What kind of a truck was this? Because most people attempted in the whatever vehicle they have when they first make the commitment like a Subaru Forester or a yeah. two wheel drive. I've seen some weird, really small little hatchbacks make it where I thought <laughs> my truck wasn't going to go. So yeah, I'm always uh, uh, in awe of the vehicles that go up some of these trails. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I did have the common sense to buy it. I bought a Tacoma TRD um, truck. It was like a 2002 stick shift one. And I bought a little four wheel camper found a used 1982 four wheel camper and popped it on the back. And that was my, my ride of choice in 2013. Uh, and, and we made it. I mean, it was so hard. I weighed, I'm, I'm five foot 11. I weighed 133 pounds when I finished, uh, which is not good for a five foot 11 guy. You know, <laughs> and, um, man, it was so hard though. And, and I was so scared for most of that 24 days because I well, didn't have you, had you ever been up that high on a rock face that was class four or class five? No, I'd never done class four or five. I had done five 14 ers The highest one was a class three. And I had just, I had never done anything class four or five before. And so, um, and it rained. So that was the, that 24 day period was in the floods of 2013 in August, September, which wiped out like, tons of towns on the front range and and so it, ran, it ended up raining significantly 19 out of the 24 days i was out there so you know up on some of these technical mountains and blasting storms and all that was it was terrifying i will say i i it changed who i was i beat depression i i found myself i found my motivation in life again i i found my motivation to be a parent and for you know i beat suicide it, it changed the whole direction of my life be frankly honest so it was it was amazing i went kind of through the same thing in um i want to say it was 2016 17 it was right around 2018 i made the decision that i was going back to the mountains because i was born and raised in the mountains so you know i i had done a lot of the 14ers i think up to 24 25 by the time i committed to all of them okay and i had gone through a divorce and i was going through depression and, you know, some anxiety, but I still had the kids full time and working and trying to figure out how to be a single parent and provide. And, yeah. and man, I found some time because uh, of being self-employed to get out during the week and I would just go climb and yeah. it was so freeing and the feeling of being on top of the mountains. I mean, it's a religious feeling. It is. It's really something else. And I think it's a lot the same for most people is they get up and they realize how small their problems become. Yeah, when they see how big of a landscape and how big of a place they actually live. So that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. And then you committed to your next journey. How long did that take to commit to the next goal? Yeah, so I, I did them in 24 days. And it just, at the time, it just kind of set this little bug that I could set the record. And I didn't even know what the record was at the time because I don't think either FKT wasn't around yet or... um Peter's record wasn't on it at the time. And so there was just this gr yeah. great unknown for the self-supported record. I remember Googling and trying to find it right afterwards and I couldn't find a record. So I was like, well, maybe I have the record. I don't know, but just, you know, I don't feel like I should have the record because I didn't even know what I was doing and I got lost and yeah. all this stuff, you know, I was highly not, in, not prepared for anything back then. <laughs> I certainly didn't read any books or anything like that. So, like, what do uh, I need to prepare for lightning for? Like, yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, wait, there's lightning. But I, I realized, like, maybe this is a skill I have. I can clearly go faster than most people in the mountains. And I've never been, I've literally done nothing athletic my entire life. I've never competed in a single sport. I've never even participated in a single sport. And, um, and so then I found myself being really quite fast in the mountains. And so that set the seed, but then, you know, I went back home to Minnesota and I still, you know, I was a dad, I was dealing with divorce and 
financial ruin out of that and trying to like get on my feet again. And I started a business and, uh, you know, so it all kind of went to the wayside, but it was always there in the back of my head. And two years later, I was uh, in my office in downtown Minneapolis with a sport coat on at my desk and see this news reel come across that Andrew Hamilton sets the less than 10 day for supported 14 er record. Yeah. And I remember opening it and the feeling I felt was one of regret. And I was like, that should be me. That's what I want to do with my life. This is all I want. I literally thought this is all I want out of my life. Like all this other stuff I'm working at is fine. I want a record in the mountain. So I ended up taking two years of my life to train and set the record. And it just was a dream come true uh, as far as, you know, life being able to make that happen. And I'm, I'm super appreciative to everyone in my life and, you know, to God for aligning things that I had no power over to allow me to have the opportunity that I did to take a full two years of my life and not really work in that whole time period and just train. Yeah. Well, I remember, I think I met you on your two year venture, right? That was when yeah. we were on Little Bear together. Yeah. And it, that kind of comes up in the documentary and your face is on there. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, that's totally great. Yeah, that was that was a life changing experience we had there. <laughs> yeah, I'll never uh, forget the yeah. the tr the crew because it was Candace, you and Max. And yep. we had nicknames for everybody by the time we were done <laughs> in that short amount of time. Because yep. life was on the line. We all thought we were dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For that minute or whatever it was, two minutes when those rocks were coming down, like I, I thought we were dead. I mean, that was intense. That was, that's still the worst thing to ever happen to me in the mountains was, was that experience when I met you. Yeah. It's either completely motivating or debilitating, right? Yeah. Yep. I mean, you see it and you go, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't be up there. And then a few right. days later you think, Oh no, I'm going to go back up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Give it a little break. And then here we go. But yeah, that's yeah. like, I, I promised I would never do capital again. And I keep second guessing myself. Like I should never say never because I'm kind of yeah. having reoccurring urges to go back and do it again. But yeah, you know, uh, I don't know. Capital is my favorite, man. I, I, I think you should do it more than once. It's a spectacular mountain. No yes. doubt. Now you're in a vehicle that's much more equipped for handling a solo adventure unsupported. Yeah. Yep. And that van looked pretty beat up when I saw it. So how, what kind of condition <laughs> is it in now? Cause those roads, man, are yeah. nothing, nothing nice. No. Yeah. Especially uh, Como road. And how did you get up Como road? Yeah. Uh, with the van. So I bought in 2020 <laughs> 20, in 2020, uh, I bought this van called Beast from a guy in Las Vegas who had built it up. Um, so it's a 2011 or 2009 Ford Econoline, but the whole suspension system was taken off and replaced with a modified four wheel drive, like rock crawler suspension on it. So it's kind of like a monster truck van. And, uh, and then I, I built a camper into it. And so uh, but I custom built the van for the record. So everything about the van was built for the record. So I had an extra gas tank, so I didn't have to fill up as often. I, I, you know, even just the, the four wheel drive system on it was exactly what I needed. I had an air compressor built into it so I could, you know, raise and lower my tires. And, you know, if I had a flat, I could fix it. Um, I, the whole interior, the way the bed and the kitchen were set up was for maximum efficiency for the race. I, I took the passenger seat out and replaced it with a refrigerator and a microwave so I could get food and eat while driving. Uh, that reminds me of a lot of construction site vans. Guys on the job would always pull up and they'd have a microwave in the seat <laughs> next to yep. them. They yep. eat up lunch. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you can you can be on the move and eating. And so, yeah, Beast is, Beast is kind of wild. It, it gets everywhere. I've I can get beast up to Jaws one on Como Road. Uh, I can't really get past that because its wheelbase is super long still. Uh, yeah. I the, when I was up there on my way down, there was that uh, SUV that was parked that was all beat up and people yeah. blown out the windows and things. And then I got a little farther, and even before Jaws, somebody in a Toyota Tacoma, it was all lifted and everything. He was stuck on the side and he yeah. tried to get around. You remember that? Yeah, he got he stuck got on his, the side of the road. He got his back wheels just barely off and he was like, 
I'm waiting for a tow truck. Because, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to lose my truck off this edge because it was yeah. just trees and ravine below him. And sure enough, there was a, a lifted Jeep that stood like eight feet off the ground that was going to come rescue him. Yep. I thought that's that's ridiculous. Of course, yeah. I was hauling like six people in the Razor at the time. <laughs> yeah. They were I mean, so happy that taxi I was bet. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, man, your Razor was, that's the way to go on those things. I mean, Beast is great, but it's still pretty tough on those big, those big roads. Actually on the, on the record, I almost rolled beast off the side, uh, on Como road. I was, that was that for me, that was the hardest day of the record. Um, cause I was, I was stomach sick for eight of this 14 days. Well, there we go. It was 14 days. I, I broke the silence. Um, <laughs> but I, I was, I was, um, I was stomach sick for eight of the days and that was the day I was by far the sickest and, and the most sick. And I, I was a mess and, I had gotten up at about three that morning and I was coming down Como road at like 11 30 PM and had no sleep in the middle and only got like less than three hours the night before. And beast is huge, right? It's nine feet tall, 10,000 pounds, and it's wider than most of the Jeeps out there too. And this big, huge boulder had like shifted and rolled onto the road. Um, and the Jeep guys just squeezed around it. And I could squeeze around it, but when I was coming down and squeezing around, my my cliffside wheel on the outside of the road was literally on the edge. I mean, it was like right on the edge, you know, and I would, my head, I was out the window and I was inching around this thing. And all of a sudden, because it had been, it had rained a lot that week before this, the road just started collapsing and Beast just started, the front wheel of Beast went down and the back end picked up over the edge and, uh, Thankfully, I have axle lockers on Beast, and so I just gunned it and turned it in, and you know I had the axles locked, so it, it didn't free spin, and it pulled the van back out off the edge and Ooh. got out of there. But man, that was that was probably one of the scariest times is feeling the van tip over the edge, like and just that sense of hopelessness. Yeah, in the off-roading community, we call that camber. So you actually got the vehicle on a yeah an outside was... turn camber and then turned out of it. Oh, you're lucky. Yeah, super lucky. I, I think I was being watched over. Uh, Let's talk about some of the problems that you ran into from day one so everybody can get a grip a grip on just how much trouble they're in for if they, you know, yeah. if they try something like this. Because there's unknowns. You think, oh, I'm, I'm athletic. I've done ultras. You know, I've gone 100 miles. But this yeah. is not the same. Here, it's just you end up with vertical walls and your knees take a beating. So just yeah. give us a little hint on that. Really hard to describe the difficulties of this journey. Cause again, like you said, I mean, when I, when you explained, I climbed 58 mountains, the climbing wasn't necessarily the hard part, uh, to be frankly honest, the logistics and the terrain and all of that sort of things, they add up. Um, so to touch on like the knees, I had, my knees were, I had issues with them from day one. I mean, and I was in quite a bit of pain for the entire um, record duration. Uh, part of the reason was I, I started at uh, 1 40 AM, uh, right around 1 40 AM on July 5th. And it was pouring rain out in the middle of the night. And I was going to climb, you know, class three plus mountain, you know, class four uh, mountains. I did uh, Eolus, uh, North Eolus and sunlight and totally socked in in the rain at, at, in the dark and my GPS didn't work and I was late and I got way behind and um, I didn't die, thankfully. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, thankfully. Yeah. You're still here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Andrew told me when he, uh, I shouldn't laugh at this, when he started his, I think it was his first major 14er record, somebody died on Eolus like when he was climbing up it, somebody fell off the top and he had to like stay with the body until a helicopter came in. Um, no and way. so like, it's not, it's, you know, it's really not a trivial mountain. It doesn't seem hard in good weather, but like it, it, in bad weather in the middle of the night, it's pretty traumatizing. I did the <laughs> leap of faith on sunlight, you know, there's like a two, there's a gap between these two rocks and you have to jump over like a thousand foot fall to get to the summit and like bear hug that, it. And it that was, big leaning rock yeah yeah yep it was soaking wet when i did that and socked in <laughs> and by the time i got to windham i had to run down and get on a train at 10 30 a.m to get out of there i ended up running from the top of windham all the way down to the train uh you know six seven thousand feet of vertical 
I don't know how many miles that is, like 10 miles. Uh, I had, you know, my backpack with my tent and sleep bag in it. And so that, that wrecked my knees on day one. So with that said, though, the hardest part really wasn't the hiking. It was not even the knees and the pain and the technicality and the weather. It was trying to keep logistics together and trying to fight all the bad things that happen all the time uh, in the Rockies. And so <laughs> not only is like the hiking terrain tough, the driving terrain is tough, the weather's tough, the you know, I, the main fuse on my auxiliary system, which ran my freezers and microwave and everything on my van blew out like three times. The first time it happened, it was, I was going over Independence Pass at midnight and I had not slept in 20 hours and, and, you know, I'm barely able to keep my eyes open and it was below freezing and I'm laying on the ground in a t-shirt and shorts trying to find the fuse. And, and you know, I mean, it just was, there's so much stuff like that. I had to fix someone's truck on the road up to the Crestones. Uh, they broke down in the middle of the four wheel drive road and I had to like get my toolbox out and go fix his truck and get him moving. And of course you're, and, you're not going to just leave him there as a good Samaritan, like boy scout, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did, I did a good deed, but like all these things happened, you know, in a row. And then when we met in 2021, I climbed all the 14 years that summer. Uh, and some of them multiple times just to figure out, you know, some of the logistics on it. And I had spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours over that two year period on a computer and at home mapping things out and planning it, and, you know, equipment. I had a dirt bike and a mountain bike and like all this stuff. And you have to, it, it, all of it can break and all of it has to work just perfectly in your timing to, to get these done in 14 days on a self-supported endeavor. Like it, you can't screw up ever. There's no margin of error in that. And so holding all of that together is a huge weight. And, um, you know, I had a huge reroute uh, after I did um, the sound grades and then Pike's Peak. There was only two days left of potentially good weather and the whole rest of the forecast. And so I rerouted the whole record. Like I, I skipped all the, all the mountains outside of Leadville and Buena Vista and went to Aspen and did those. And then I came back and reversed the whole second half of the, the record. And like, I had to figure all that out on the fly on no sleep and like not screw it up. And like, Oh my gosh, there's just so much stuff that you have to hold together. And it's so stressful. Uh, it's, that's the hard part. I remember, I remember the rescheduling because I, I did the same thing. I printed out a list multiple times of like, okay, this is where I'm going to go. Cause I tried to stay to the traditional routes as much as humanly possible yeah. just to give it a feel for exactly what someone else is going to go through if they do the traditional route. And what I mean yeah. by traditional is like the expected route that's on every map, right? 14ers.com yep. is going to give you one route, right? Yep. So I found my own creative ways, obviously, but as far as rerouting, you know, I went from one section of the Rockies and had to find a whole new section. So I went from doing capital and the next day doing castle conundrum. And then I had to drive all the way over to do longs or not longs peak, but Pikes peak, because that was the only good weather in the state. Right. So it was like a six hour drive yeah. over the passes and through the woods. And I got at the parking lot at 11 o'clock at night, you know, it's not oh, mad. Yeah. <laughs> so I know the rescheduling. Then when we were down in, you know, the San Juans, it was the same way. I got rained out again. And so we were kind of shuffling around and, if you have the option to move around, that's great. But if you yeah. run out of time and you're like, so Here did I you am. ever get stuck where you just committed to it? Uh, other than the, the Wyndham group. The Bell's Traverse was one of the more traumatizing days of my life, honestly. So I was at the summit of South Maroon and this storm just hit hard. I and mean, it was the whole mountain turned electric. The rocks were shaking, and, you know, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on the rocks will actually shake and hit each other when they're electrified enough and lightning and thunder and it started it hailed and snowed and sleeted. And I ended up having to just sprint across the summit of South Maroon. I'm pretty sure I have the FKT for crossing the summit on South Maroon. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was lit. I pulled my GPS tracker out because I was tagging each summit. I got it all queued up. And I literally sprinted as, I mean, I was probably doing like a five minute mile across the summit and like dove over the other side down to the traverse. But then I did the traverse and it was covered in snow and sleet and hail. And, you know, there was still lightning going on for about half of it. Um, it was, I was very traumatized from that. And then you're a brave, brave man. <laughs> 
Is, yeah, or, or maybe maybe stupid. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that could be a word for it. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the two. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with brave. Yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> uh, but it was, oh, man, I was I was like at the point of tears, honestly. And you know, I have two kids, and that's what I couldn't get out of my head was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I just want to be like holding my kids and being a good dad and loving them because – to me, they're way more important than this record, but I found myself in this spot and, and just had to push myself forward. And I, you know, I, I could have turned around too, and I didn't, and I had to, that's, that's a decision. I had a really hard time living with myself over having made, um, there was a parts of this record that were very dark because of that, you know, and I feel like it took some of the humanity from me, some of the things that are good about me. I had to give up in that. And I, it was, it actually felt very dark. I felt very, it took me about 10 days of just quiet time by myself to kind of get myself back after the record. Um, so you felt a little internally selfish, like you made the wrong decision. Yeah, not a little, like I knew I made the wrong decision and I made <laughs> it anyways. And I made it consciously and I made it knowingly. And, and it wasn't the only time I had to make that decision. Um, and I just, that's what I did. And yeah, that's and intense. But if you lose yourself, you know, and that limit of like, this is how far I'm going to go and I'm not going to go past that, but then you actually do. Yeah. And then you're internalizing the regret, right? There was definitely some dark times in it for the rest of the record. It stormed every day. I mean, there was no let up even on my last mountain on longs the whole way up. It was blasting and lightning and thunder and rain. And you could actually run the key, the, the keyhole route. I mean, I ran as soon as I got done sliding on my butt, I literally ran the rest of it. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, you know, the funny part is, is like the videos I took, you know, my folks freak out anytime I'm on kind of a ledge and I, I get spooked a little bit. But that flat spot, when you get towards the keyhole from where you come down, the really steep spot, yeah. even that on film, it looks terrifying because yeah. it's a long ways down, but it's not as steep maybe as it seems. At least yeah. in my mind, it played out a lot more mellow than it really is, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but there's places if you trip and went over to the side, you're not coming back. True. <laughs> yeah. So a lot, lot of issues, a lot of hiccups that you have to work out in the yeah. moment. So you got to be problem solving the whole time. You got to be prepared for first aid and mechanics and other people that you're trying to look out for. Did you take a big pack when you were actually up on the peak or did you just pack like two water bottles and a snack? Yeah, it was pretty minimalist. Um, I had my gear really dialed in. And so I always took rain gear uh, every day, but I had really ultra late rain gear and yeah. and f food and water, um, gloves and an ear band. And uh, that was about it. So yeah, it all fit into a little ultra running pack for me. Yeah. It's amazing how little water there is on some of these peaks because people are like, oh, you could just take a little filter and you know, scoop it up and then, you know, save yeah. some time. And that's pretty minimal as far as what specific peaks you can do that on. Yeah. Like I, I only remember a handful of peaks where it was like halfway up, I could find water. Yeah. Yep. No, there's, there's only a few. Again, I had done them all in 2021. And one of the things I recorded is every water hole on every mountain. <laughs> so I, I had a pretty that's well nice. di dialed in exactly where I needed to fill up and which ones I needed to take a filter on, which ones I didn't. But uh, that's, yeah, that's mean, smart. Yeah. Cause yeah. water, I mean, carrying all the water you need for a day, that's a lot of water and a lot of weight. So, I mean, I was carrying, I think 80 ounces in the morning oh. and by six hours later I was out, like I was gone. Oh, yeah. So I was yeah. having to refill, you know, every four to six hours, but that was pretty much, I tried to stick to an eight hour day on at least my trip. I know yours yeah. was 24, 24, 24, <laughs> just every day grueling. But how much sleep did you allot yourself? What I allotted and what I got were very different. <laughs> so the plan was to get five hours a night. What I got was about three and a half. And Oof. so uh, the five hour plan was was where every minute which but was budgeted out. But it, what it didn't budget in was the truck breaking and this happening and that happening. And and the, it wasn't enough. I, I had some real physical problems that were developing. I had sores in my mouth. I had um, this persistent bad cough towards the end that I just coughed all the time and I couldn't stop coughing. And I, on the last night, um, 
I laid down to take a 10 minute nap after dark on top of uh, Tori's and I couldn't sleep because I was coughing so much. I just was nonstop coughing. Do you think that was fluid in your lungs from the elevations? Uh, I think it was fluid from my immune system shut, being completely shut down from being sleep deprived and, and falling apart. I remember hearing stories of guys trying to do it, you know, man powered without a vehicle. And he ended up coming out with, you know, some sort of, uh, toxicity in his, his blood or something. And it took him, you know, months of rehab Yeah, but because his diet was terrible too. I mean, diet, you have to play into it cause you're burning thousands of calories. Yeah. So tell me about your diet. I know you had lactose intolerance at some point. I made all of my food in advance. I made it all to be handheld so I could drive and eat. I somehow developed a really terrible dairy lactose uh, allergy uh, pretty much at the start of the record. Um, I think the, I probably had this issue before, but the stress on my body exemplified it. And like I spent eight of the 14 days very stomach sick, like throwing up, nauseous, uh, dry heaving, um, you, you know, dizzy. A severe abdominal pain. Um, it took me five days to figure it out, and then one day for it to go away, and then two days before the end, I, in a moment of tiredness, ate a big cheesy burrito <laughs> without thinking about what I was doing. And as soon as I got done, I realized what I had done, and so I spent the last last two days sick as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was trying to eat about six thousand calories a day. My plan was if I was awake, I was eating. And if I was not hiking, I was eating. But while I hiked, I ate uphill or downhill. Um, I ate a lot of nuts and dried fruit because I could just hold a bag of it and eat while I walked. And uh, that was the goal. And actually, it worked pretty good overall, even with the stomach sickness, uh, which again was circumstantial to the dairy. I only lost like five or seven pounds this time. And yeah. the first First time I did it, I lost over 20 pounds in 2013. So, oh wow! Uh, to not be able to consume the exact thing that you needed, yeah, and have to right. offset that somehow on the go—that's that's really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. I ended up going to the grocery store. I think it was four times, which took many hours. So that added to the record, cut out of my sleep, uh, and I had never shopped dairy free before. And it's in America and probably Europe too, but it's very—it's actually very difficult to to find food that you don't have to cook, you know, that can provide you that many calories that's not full of dairy. First time at the grocery store, I was there for like an hour because I couldn't even, I didn't know what to buy. I kept like having to read everything. And uh, <laughs> anyway, You hadn't done your research on lactose intolerance before you left. What were you thinking? No. Like, <laughs> I know, right? Jeez. Come uh, prepared yeah. again next time, would you? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> all, I got to prepare for all scenarios, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was that was really tough. And I had spent so much time planning my food. I mean, I had calorie charts and all this stuff figured out. And then to just like, again, have to just throw it all out and then figure it out on the go. And it was yeah. all very, very complicated. Yeah, I remember loading up the truck with just ice chests full of refrigerated and frozen and drinks and, and just anything yeah. I could take I took because it was in a vehicle. So I was like, hey, you know, I'll eat as much as I can, when I can, however I can. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I might have gotten a little bit luckier if I had had that happen because I made some pretty amazing granola bars that had, you know, no dairy in it. But yeah, the, the calorie density was really hard to, you know, science out. It's like, how many calories can I get in one little bar? <laughs> right. It was, yeah. Pack it but then your there. stomach, yeah, I've heard uh, athletes talk about how it doesn't digest really well when you're on that much of a, a go, you know? Yeah. What's the company? Um, they make goo gels and stuff, but I'm not I'm not a big fan of those. Stinger makes the honey ones that are easier to digest. Yeah, Spring Energy worked really well for me. I I loved those because they offset okay. with berries and all kinds of you know good uh, stuff right. and a lot of apple stuff. And, yeah, but they're calorie dense, so you can get like 500 calorie packs that taste like oatmeal. Huh. Uh, wow, those were those were nice. Yeah, uh, my, I think my folks got me a big pack of them before I left. So I was like, I'm not going to need these. And I had like three every single day. Oh, they were man. amazing. <laughs> That's great. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then I think I, I offset it even more. I, I took uh, Juice Plus to keep me regular because my worst fear was being on the mountain and having to like control, you know, any kind of weird bowel movements or something because there's no place like 
if yeah. once you're out there, it's rocks. That's all. Right. <laughs> Wide so, open. Yeah. It's <laughs> like there's no you're exposed. Like yeah. you, there's no, almost no place to hide on some of it. Nope. Yeah. Like no, Shabano Tabo Watch. I mean, you're going over the top of that. Where is there to hide on Shabano? Like no. Yeah. You got a couple hours, <laughs> you're you're pretty much stuck. Yeah. Yep. And you go over and it's like an hour across that, you know, big exposed area. Oh, you, yeah. You're stuck. That's funny. True story. <laughs> yeah, true, true story. It happens to the best of us. Uh, so let's talk about best and worst peaks. You you mentioned Capital being one of your favorites, one of yeah. the most dangerous. Um, Longs has actually got the record for deaths as far as the dark side of those mountains, just because it's so popular. I think more recreational tourists or hikers just attempt yeah. it and don't realize what they're getting into. Yeah. But Capital's more of like they know what they're getting into and they still can't make it yeah um i remember the year we were hiking and i met you there was a, a kid that fell off a capital um and then the rescue crew got hit with rocks while they were up there yeah so there's yeah. A, i mean on both sides there's just no getting away from that that mountain is scary yeah but then there's others that nobody anticipates like you know what we found out was el diente yeah and yeah i don't, that, don't like that mountain as much as i do yeah <laughs> The, the gully of death on El Diente. I mean, yeah. and some of that is how you do El Diente too. I mean, there's other ways off of it that are nicer, but yeah, favorite. I, I do really love Capital. I think I've, I've done it five or six times, and I've never had bad weather. I've always loved it. And uh, well, conversely, my, my well, least favorite mountain, by far, hands down, no questions, is Snowmass. I really hate Snowmass. <laughs> I've never had a good experience. It's the most miserable. If you do it on the way the record is done, it's it's will be the hardest mountain of your entire life. It is I there are not words to explain how hard that route is to I remember it. I remember it being really difficult. And I had come from Maroon, so my day was really long because I had gone up uh Maroon Peak the, that morning and then gone over Buckskin Pass. Oh wow. So that that turned out to be a really long day for me because I wasn't pushing records, but yeah. Uh, that that does ring a bell my legs were hurting but i yeah. don't know if i i did the traditional route of it so i don't know if you cut you know straight up the face or something uh to get to snowmass yeah well no. i i did snowmass i did capital and snowmass in the same day and oh so you came from the other side i came yeah. from directly from capital over there and somebody told me that some geologist did a study on the rock in that basin between the two and i don't know how he quantified there's forever and again this is not first party knowledge but they said the guy just the, the guy's report said it is literally the worst rock in the western hemisphere like there is there is yeah, no they call it, it is, shock rock yeah it's so unstable and it's so dangerous i mean it is terrifying getting over satan's ridge is incredibly terrifying i mean it's aptly named and <laughs> uh and for instance like it's about it's it's about six miles to get from Capital to Snowmass, and it takes between five and six hours as like at pro athlete level of energy. And yeah, so, I remember there are a few areas like that across the state. One, there's Chalk Rock on the backside of Princeton, which I believe they've closed. Yeah, it's dangerous. At least closed, right? Because they don't want people back there because the yeah. mountain keeps falling apart, and it's yep. just it's chalky. It's not real good rock. So I can imagine that traverse being the same and then uh there was one other one i'm trying to recall oh the backside of columbian harvard when you drop down into that big gully it's not bad rocks yeah, but it's just these huge boulders that you have to climb over yeah and i i went over the ridge one one time over you know they call it the rabbit but it's yeah like the rabbit really, yeah yeah but it's a lot more difficult and it seemed not worth it the last time I, I went. So I went down the gully and back up, but I didn't realize there was those just gargantuan house-sized rocks that yeah. you have to climb up. And that's, yeah. that takes a lot out of you. The little stuff, not so bad, yeah. but the big rocks, man, it's like, yeah. oh, it takes all your energy. Yep. So I can imagine that because I, I looked over that a few times and thought, oh, there is a way over there, but yeah. never not tried it. it. Not worth it. If you're not trying to set, set a record, don't do it. It is It will be the worst thing you've ever done to yourself if you survive. <laughs> I'm not trying to ruin any good feelings anyone else has for snowmass. I just, no, you asked me and that's my honest opinion. I'm not uh, emotionally attached to the mountain, but okay. I did get rained off at once. So I, I, yeah. yeah, the only day I really had fun was the Crestones day. 
Uh, it was, I really, I had good weather and, you know, it's just so bizarre because it was like the one day I had fun. And then I find out that, you know, within an hour of me being there, somebody died. It's always something. Yeah. You know, and it was just, it kind of brought reality. Like, man, these are real mountains. Yeah. Even when we were there, there was somebody that the next morning got stuck on the needles and they had to be helicoptered off because I remember seeing the chopper come in. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They were down, down below there. So yeah, those are serious mountains. And how emotional was it on the last peak? Were you, were you like in tears when you were done or what did that that feel like? Yeah. So this is, this is interesting. I cried probably 10 times (laughs) thinking about finishing during the record. (laughs) Yeah. The anticipation in my mind, I was living that moment, you know, crossing that finish line and coming down longs and how amazing that was going to be. And uh, two days before I finished a complete mental breakdown, like I lost my all of my sanity. I was screaming and crying like a toddler. And like, I, I just got pushed over the edge. And from that point on, I literally felt nothing. And like I had my physical and mental and emotional being was so spent. And so when I ended up crossing the finish line, even though I had cried 10 times thinking about it. I was just like, I just sat down and I don't remember what I said. It was something like, well, I'm glad that's over. And I like, just was like, (laughs) just so drained. I didn't have enough left to even feel emotions. It was, and I was so mad. I was like, I wanted this to be emotional. You know, I mean, I was just like, I'm so looking forward to this. And now I'm like, I hate this so much. Yeah, I know. I'm like, couldn't I at least had enough energy to be happy, you know? And I, I, didn't I was so tired and just out of it and I was just like well <laughs> I'm done okay guys let's go home you know I mean it's it's comical to hear it but I'm sure in the moment you know and man I wish I'd have been there I, I really yeah, would I, I probably could have cool. helped you get picked back up and feel better about yourself <laughs> good <laughs> An emotional said. shoulder to cry on right yeah get a little celebration going but. or a shoulder to punch for a little while you know bring a punching bag just oh, yeah right. <laughs> why <laughs> Let it out. Let it out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been awesome. But uh, yeah. it was, uh, it was good. It, it, it took a couple of days to really sink in. And I, actually the moment it really sunk in, I, I went back home and I took my kids to a local beach. It's a gorgeous Minnesota night, you know, 80 degrees, golden sunset. And I was just laying there and literally for since 2013, if I had a free moment of mental energy, I thought about setting this record. And yeah. so I'm sitting there, my kids are in the water, and I, my mind just, by natural memory, just went to like, all right, so what are we going to do? And then I just stopped. And I was like, oh, wait, I set that record. Yeah. I don't have to think about this anymore. And that's when it re- it was that one moment. That's when it set in. I was just like, I have Holy it. Cow. I, yeah, wait, it's do mine. I, did I really do that? Is, yeah. is that possible? Yeah. I don't have to think about this anymore. And that was when I hit. And I was like, I don't know, 10 days after I finished. And that was my real, like, I was like on cloud nine for a week after that. It just like, it finally hit after 10 days. Thanks Dan for being here tonight and taking valuable time out of your work. I know you're on a uh, sort of a conference trip, you said. So yeah, I really appreciate you and your story and I hope lots of people get to see it and hear it, you know, from your words instead of just an article somewhere that, you know, gets washed under and and, uh, a lot of people don't read anymore (laughs) yeah it's true so it's more entertaining especially the emotional you know when you tell it it's more real it 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 brings more volume to to hear it from your your mouth so really appreciate it yeah definitely well thanks uh, for having thanks for having me on it's been awesome and good to connect again (laughs) 